hidden in the mountains on the border with Vietnam, is one of China's best kept treasures. This is the story of an evolutionary enigma, a living fossil that has captivated us for over a century, the giant panda. Today we are going to take you on a surprising journey into the heart of the giant panda's natural habitat and reveal what we can do to save this extraordinary and complex animal. This rare creature receives star treatment around the world, a measure of how much the panda has captured public imagination. An icon of rapidly expanding China, the panda has also become the symbol of the world's endangered species. Known as Papa Panda, Professor Pan Wen Shi has spent 15 years of his life among the wild pandas, observing and studying their behavior. Today he's returning to panda territory to evaluate the future prospects of the wild panda. In the heart of Sichuan, we followed the work of scientists and caregivers in a breeding center. They work night and day to guarantee the panda's survival. This is the story of a fragile world. A millennial treasure that has yet to reveal all of its secrets. on May 12, 2008. An earthquake of magnitude 8.3 on the Richter scale struck the Sichuan region in western China. In three minutes, entire cities were wiped off the map. This is where our story begins. The earthquake struck the very heart of the land inhabited by giant pandas. For those living in the wild, the earthquake was a catastrophe. But for the 63 pandas taking part in the first conservation program, the disaster revealed the extraordinary commitment of their caregivers. Despite being at the center of the earthquake and its hundreds of dangerous aftershocks, these men and women risked their lives to save the pandas, caring for them as they would their own children. The story of how this animal went in less than a century from hunter's prey to stardom is truly extraordinary. For biologists, this creature, which looks more like a giant teddy bear than a wild animal, remains a genuine mystery. A species with such a fragile and unique constitution shouldn't have survived under the evolutionary law of nature. But it has survived for more than eight million years. At first, the panda bear was carnivorous, like most of its bear cousins. And then, suddenly, it lost its taste for meat. That was over four million years ago. Now a vegetarian, the panda began to chew bamboo, pounds and pounds of bamboo each day. Coincidentally, at that time, China was covered in bamboo but their hunger for the plant would eventually cost them dearly. When humans arrived in China less than 100,000 years ago, they began to do what they always do, make room for themselves. For the pandas, tragedy lay ahead. As their food supply began to disappear, so did they. And since then, century after century, the territory of the giant pandas has only declined. If deforestation continues at its present rate, the panda will soon join the long list of extinct species. Here in the Sichuan capital of Chengdu, 
population 14 million, we are far from the last natural habitats of the wild pandas. Yet it is in this urban environment that a team of veterinarians has succeeded in breeding pandas in captivity, hoping one day to reintroduce them into the wild. It's 11 o'clock in Chengdu. Sheltered from the bustle of the city, a team of young trainers and vets care around the clock for a new generation of baby pandas, born at the center three months earlier. <laughs> Chen Min and Zhang Ho take turns without a break. Every step is made according to plan, each operation adhering to an extremely rigorous protocol. Thirty years ago, China decided to create three centers like this one. The Chengdu Center is the largest and most important. Built in 1987, the center began its work with six pandas found in the wild. Today, it is home to 108 giant pandas, all born within its walls. Come on, you twins. Stay together. Come here, I'm going to help. There you go, one after the other. I know you two are real chatterboxes. Are you hungry? Are you hungry, is that it? I spend more time taking care of pandas than my own son. Luckily, my parents are there to help out. They bring him back and forth to school. There are a lot of us taking care of the pandas. Someone has to be here 24-7. I've become really attached to them. It's like they're my own children. I have a hard time leaving them when it's time to go. Each panda is given over 100 pounds of bamboo each day. To avoid nutritional deficiencies, Chen Min prepares dietary supplements fortified with vitamins and minerals. Hu Rong supervises the collection of a sperm sample. As scientific director, she is responsible for achieving the Chengdu Center's primary goal to control the reproduction of giant pandas in captivity. This is no easy task. Female pandas are only in heat two or three days a year. In case no male is available at the time, the center keeps a supply of sperm frozen in liquid nitrogen. After a sample is taken and before the insemination, Hu Rong examines the sperm's viability under a microscope. In order to detect when females are in heat, 
or if they are suffering from the slightest problems of health or development, each animal is subjected to thorough and regular medical examinations. They grow used to them. Blood samples are taken so frequently that the pandas are comfortable with the procedure. At Chen Min's request, the panda sits and calmly extends its paw, long enough for the veterinarian Yang and his assistant to draw three small vials of blood. This surprising conditioning allows the team to avoid general anesthesia, which always comes with a risk. Natural couplings account for more than half the births of giant pandas. In the 1980s, Pan Wenxi, a professor at the University of Beijing, was the first to sound the alarm. In order to unravel the mystery of the giant pandas and to find ways to better protect them, Wen Shi decided to travel to their last refuge. He spent 17 years in the mountains of Qinling. Day after day, he earned the trust of the small population of wild pandas, growing closer to them. He was even able to witness a birth. He named the female Jiao Jiao and her baby Xi Wang, Hope. Zhao Zhao became his favorite panda. He lived by her side for the next 10 years and was present for six births. <coughs> Throughout China, Professor Pan became known and respected as Papa Panda. Thousands of kilometers south of Qinling and Chengdu, we're back with Professor Pan. Today, he is 74 years old and has retired to the Vietnamese border, far from the pandas. He is now observing and working to protect the white-headed langur, a species even more endangered than the giant panda, but much less discussed in the media. But one cannot forget an animal as endearing as the panda. Every night, he works on a new book that gathers the results of his 17 years of research in Qinling. This is Jiao Jiao, huh? Jiao Jiao. This female here is Jiao Jiao, and her first baby was named Hu Ji. The protection of the environment hasn't changed much in the last 27 years. Sadly, the panda's territory isn't continuous. It looks like small islands. Even if deforestation is outlawed now, human activity goes on. People harvest rice and corn near the border of the panda's territory. Today, the two main panda territories are very small. They barely cover 700 square kilometers, and they're mainly home to females. On an eroding cliff, Professor Pan has undertaken a paleontological dig and made an incredible find. Among the numerous mammal skeletons, he discovered the fossilized skull and teeth of an ancestor of the giant panda. We discovered this skull deep in the cave. It belonged to an ancestor of the panda, more than two million years old. Back then, pandas were living all over China. Take a close look at this jaw. The incisors are here, and we can see the premolars at the back. They're a little damaged. Eight million years ago, the panda evolved into a type of bear about the size of this small dog. Every night, a small group of langurs comes to sleep on these limestone cliffs where they're safe from predators. Professor Pan is the first person to show an interest in their fate just as he did 30 years ago for the giant panda.
In the morning, we find Professor Pan in the company of another endangered species. They're called the pandas of the sea. I came here for the first time in 2003 to study the white dolphins. My relationship with the dolphins goes back to my childhood. When I was 11 years old, I was swimming far out in the ocean, and suddenly a strong wind began to blow. I didn't have enough energy to make it back to the beach. I thought I was going to drown. So I floated on my back to regain my strength. All of a sudden, something strange started pushing my body from underneath. Two dolphins had brought me back to the beach. Since then, I've done everything I can to protect them. Although the professor might think of his days in Kinling as over, it's not easy to forget the story that linked him to the pandas. Thousands of kilometers away, one of his former trackers suddenly needs his help. One of the historic sites where wild pandas could still be observed has just been devastated by torrential rains. An entire face of the mountain collapsed in the same location where Pan had once conducted his research. Since then, no one has seen the pandas. Where are they? Did they survive? The professor decides to travel there in person to survey the damages. He reunites his old team of trackers. They set out on an expedition to assess the situation and find out if the wild pandas are still in the region. There is much at stake. Since the catastrophe, no one has laid eyes on the panda. It's the middle of March, mating season. Now is when the pandas descend into the valleys in search of young bamboo shoots. It's the best time to spot the pandas and make contact with them. It is also in March that Pan was able to take his best photographs during his research. During the rest of the year, pandas are solitary, shy of humans, and discreet. One can walk right past them without realizing it. It's the first day of the expedition, the first day in the reserve since the disaster. Today, Pan is too old to explore the steep slopes of Kinling. He stays back at the base camp so as to not slow down the team of trackers. They will be his eyes and ears and bring him daily reports of their observations. After hours of walking, they are alarmed by what they see where numerous pandas once made their nests. Dead animals are an indication of the devastation of what were once bamboo forests. My house was destroyed. I haven't come back here since the catastrophe. I didn't know what it was going to look like. It's impressive. The river washed away all the bamboo growing on the banks. That must have had an impact on the pandas who used to come eat here. Follow me. We're going deeper in. Last year, you could see some up there. The day has not been fruitful. They have just found a few marks on a tree, sadly too old to be of any use. A lone Takin is disturbed in his sleep by the team. Night falls on the valley, which remains tragically silent. Pan remembers how long it took him to find the pandas and hopes that his team's patience will soon pay off. Usually, around this time of year, 
The valley echoes with the calls of females and the sounds of males fighting. Each panda carefully marks trees, leaving behind a strong odor that serves as an identity card. Males converge on the territory of a female in heat and fight violently to win her favor. Meanwhile, the female sits perched on a tree, awaiting the outcome of the battle. The loser of the fight must now retreat and let the dominant male ensure his offspring. Far from the steep slopes of Qinling, the Chengdu Center is preparing to send two of its young residents to the other side of the world. Zhang Hao is in charge of preparing Huan Huan and Yuan Zi for their visit to the Beauval Zoo in France. She's called Huan Huan, and he's Yuan Zi. They were born in 2008 just after the Wulong earthquake. They're in full health. We call them the children of the earthquake. They're not related. That's why we put them together. They have very different personalities, but they get along well because they grew up together. Compared to Huan Huan, Huan Zi is much more discreet. Rodolphe Delors, the director of the Beauval Zoo, has made the trip to collect his pandas. Following eight years of difficult negotiations and five million euros spent on state-of-the-art facilities, he wouldn't have missed this for the world. Hello. Yeah. Since the 1960s, the Chengdu research base of giant panda breeding has been commissioned by the China Zoo Association to loan pandas to the United States, Japan, South Korea, Spain, the United Kingdom, France and other countries in order to cooperate on research into the international protection of breeding. His mother is very beautiful. The pandas are loaned out for a period of 10 years, with the possibility of an extension. In accordance with the contract signed by both parties, all funds must go towards the Chinese government's research into panda breeding and habitat protection. In the 1980s and 1990s, the giant panda was regarded as perhaps the country's best ambassador, a symbol of friendship between the Chinese government and host countries. With a police escort, the two pandas, Huan Huan and Yuan Zi, cross the city of Chengdu, heading towards the international airport where a cargo plane has been especially chartered for the occasion. Today, beneath all the commotion, renting out pandas is more than just a question of money. It's also an insurance against epidemics and natural disasters, like the 2008 earthquake. The rent money can now finance research into techniques for breeding and raising the pandas as well as new experiments in reintroducing the animals into the wild. A welcome party fit for a head of state is awaiting our ambassadors. 
After spending 12 hours in a chartered flight, Huan Huan and Yuan Zi arrive at their final destination, the Zoo Park de Beauval in France. The first panda to leave China was sent, but after its death, to the Paris Museum in 1869. It was a sensation, and for 60 years, it wet the appetites of every big game hunter who saw it. It was Ruth Harkness who, in December 1936, brought the first living panda to the United States, naming it Su Lin, meaning a little bit of something very cute. Su Lin immediately made headlines, First in America, and soon across the world, a star was born. This first panda brought outside of China would die two years later at the Chicago Zoo. But it marked the beginning of a long series of pandas being taken abroad from China. A panda mania swept the globe to the point that in 1961, the Worldwide Fund for Nature chose the panda as its symbol. Depending on her physical condition, the female is able to delay the implantation of the fetus. She can also control the date at which she will give birth, three to five months later. Exhausted by the pain of her contractions, the female seeks positions that will provide relief. Hairless and blind, the baby weighs 100 grams and measures less than 20 centimeters. Its first black spots will appear in a week, and its eyes will not fully open for the next two months. Sometimes female pandas give birth to twins. In nature, sadly, the weaker of the two rarely survives. But at Chengdu, it is immediately cared for by the veterinarians. It's been several days since our team began exploring the Kinling Mountains for signs of panda life. Xian oversees the operation. This young tracker was born in these mountains. He grew up following his father and Professor Pan on their expeditions. He knows every nook and cranny. On an unexplored slope, the first signs of life begin to appear. Suddenly, in the trees above the bamboo, the trackers notice the presence of snub-nosed monkeys. They have golden fur and are found only in the mountains near Tibet. These monkeys often share a territory with giant pandas. The members of the team suddenly feel like they're on the right track. Look how many there are. Then, Hu Wanzin makes a new discovery, panda droppings. They're a few weeks old, but it's the first sign that pandas have returned to the valley. At the foot of a large rock, he notices a strange marking on a tree. He ate here. There are lots of teeth marks. 
These tracks here are more recent. It's a male. He looks fierce. Panda hair. Now that the zone has been identified, the trackers try a new technique. They play recordings of mating calls, hoping to lure nearby males. I heard it. The cries we've heard must have come from here. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. The cry of the panda is fading. He must be on the move. It's getting further away. Look. Look, there's a panda. Right there. He climbed up a tree. That one, over there. It's a female. It's a female. Look straight ahead, right in front of you. He's on the other side. That's a female. She's climbing back down. You can see the sun reflecting off her fur. Pandas are back, but this is great. Did she come down to the right or left? Right side. The team decides to relay their position to Professor Pan so that he may come join them. For the professor, it's the signal he's been waiting for. He knows the region like the back of his hand, and he'll only need a half day's walk to join the trackers. This is really wonderful. Takins with yellow coats are only found in this region. When we protect these mountain forests, we protect more than just the giant pandas. We save other species, like the snub-nosed monkey. It's specific to this region too. There are two groups here, a big and a small one. In the big group, there are three females and their children. That's a standard family structure for the snub-nosed monkey. Once the team is reunited, Xian takes the professor to where they spotted the panda. Even if he doesn't witness them firsthand, the professor can be reassured that they are out there, not so far away. He can feel their presence, and with the slightest clues, he can read the stories of their lives. Now the question is how many pandas have returned for mating season, which is crucial to their survival. How big do you think this panda is? 
I think it's an adult. This one is bigger. It's about 35 centimeters. I think it has to be bigger than the previous one. I don't see any traces of bamboo shoots, just chewed up leaves. That's a sign of good health. See? It doesn't smell bad. It smells like bamboo. Do you want to smell it? Yeah, the panda goes like this. He pulls a shoot toward him and eats all the leaves. Then he throws the shoots away. Look, there's a panda hair. We can extract DNA from it to learn about its genealogy. There's even a root on it. Mm. His concerns about the disappearance of the pandas from the valley are finally lifted. Looking drawn after long days of walking, the professor can now return to the village, his heart less heavy. Before leaving the region, Professor Pan visits the village school. He is a great storyteller who loves to talk about his adventures and explain how the pandas live. Hello. I'm here to talk to the kids about giant pandas. Hello, everyone. Please sit down. Do you know what I used to do in the mountains when I was young? I watched the wild pandas. Have you ever seen a panda? Really? Where? Okay, that's very good. But have you ever seen a wild panda in the mountains? Does anyone know how to draw a panda? No one else knows how to draw a panda? There's the eyes, the nose. These are some very happy pandas, aren't they? I'm going to tell you the story of the panda. 
You've seen pandas living in breeding centers. But did you know there are some living nearby in the mountains? What do you think is best for them? Who wants to answer? No, they're not free. In the wild, female pandas only leave their dens one month after having given birth. At that age, the babies can be left unattended, and the mother can finally eat. As the little one grows, the mother goes further and further away, and for a longer time. In order to respect this natural rhythm of daily separations and reunions at the center, babies spend time with their mothers for a few hours at a time, but always under close surveillance. We have to do everything we can to save them. We can't sit here with our arms crossed and let them disappear. Once we've mastered the reproduction and have enough births, then we can begin introducing them back into the wild and give them their freedom. That's what I'm trying to do with my work. The pandas are a national treasure. Here, they receive the best care. We give them the best food. But I think we went a little too far. We're now trying to make up for our mistakes. Today, we're starting a return to the wild program. The goal is to reduce the amount of artificial care in order to arouse their wild instincts. A new 133-hectare center just opened in Dojanyan. Even though it's not very big, much of its land is very similar to nature. We've already sent six pandas to live there in semi-freedom. There has always been a lot of controversy surrounding giant pandas, like when they're sent overseas in captivity. But I think we've managed to make progress despite all that. I'm now very optimistic about what reproduction centers can do for the wild population. With the amount of babies born each year in the centers, China will soon be able to strengthen its wild populations. But the pandas also need enough space to live in peace. Thanks to the early recommendations of Professor Pan, there are today 70 natural reserves spread throughout the panda territory, providing more opportunities for them to meet and reproduce. Perhaps one day, a new generation, helped along by the hand of man, will return to repopulate these mountains and ensure the survival of this fragile species.